So this is part two, principles of accounting two. Um, the purpose of this course is just a continuation of principles one. And in principles one, the purpose of our course was an introduction to accounting. So in, chapter, or in, in the first semester, we learned what a business is, how a business records journal entries, we talked about adjusting entries at the end of a period, we talked about how they close out the year, and then we looked at, so all of those were in terms of a service business, providing services to customers. In chapter six, we looked at a merchandising business. So how does a merchandising business account for their daily activities? So you know, a merchandising business is like Walmart. They don't make the milk, or they don't own the cows, churn the milk, bottle it, and then sell it to customers. They go and pay a farmer who has the cows, who process and then the or actually farmer sells the milk to a processing plant they process it bottle it and then they sell it to walmart so all that to say every sale that walmart makes they have a sales price which is what they charge us <clears throat> but then they also have cost of goods sold and that has to be taken out when they talk about their profit so if walmart sells a gallon of milk that's another crazy thing. If you buy a gallon of milk in New Albany, it's $3.62. If you buy a gallon of milk in Tupelo, it's $1.65. Why is that? I have no clue. Um, but anyway, so that's neither here nor there. If you're looking at that $3.62, so when you go and you buy a gallon of milk from Walmart, they don't make $3.62 on every sale of, of milk. Because embedded in that is some form of cost. So they take sales of 362 minus whatever the cost was to them to acquire that milk, and then what they're left with is gross profit. And that's what we're gonna talk about that today. But we looked at that, we introduced that in chapter six and then we finished the year, or the semester, talking about um, the statement of cash flows, okay? So this semester, we're gonna pick up, in chapter seven, we're gonna look at inventory. In chapter eight, we're gonna look at internal controls as a whole, and then specifically related to cash. In chapter nine, we're gonna look at short-term receivables and long-term receivables. In chapter 10, we're going to look at property, plant, and equipment. In chapter 11, we look at short-term liabilities. And then in chapter 14, we look at long-term liabilities. So we're going to cover six chapters. Um, just like last year, we'll have a test after every two chapters. Um, grades are set up the same way as last year. So... You'll have 12 homework assignments, three tests, a paper, and then a comprehensive final exam. So there's 800 total points that can be attained in this class, which is not necessarily true because every test, I usually try to have a built-in bonus. So your test, you could make like 105 or 104 or something like that. So, but this is what we'll use to determine grades. So to make an A, in this course, you need at least 720 points, okay? To make a B, you need at least 640. To make a C, you need at least 560. And that's really as low as I wanna encourage anybody to go. So, now think about this though. All right, your homework, you can take an unlimited amount of times, okay? If you work the homework once and you make a zero, you can turn right back around and take it until you make 100%. So it's 12 homework assignments, each worth 25 points. So that's basically a free 300 points to you if you're willing to do the work on time and put in the effort, okay? So that means out of the remaining 500 points, you have a lot of wiggle room depending on what kind of grades you wanna make in this class, okay? So. It should be very easy to attain whatever grade you want in this class. 
It's just going to take effort. Now, just like before, in the first semester, in my opinion, I know it's skewed, but I think accounting is easy. It's just different. So, you know, it's not something that we use or that you guys use as college students every day. So, in saying that, you know, if you were just picking up a baseball bat and trying to learn how to hit a baseball, you wouldn't pick it up twice a week and be able to do well. If you were going to run track, you wouldn't only run twice a week. What do you do? You run repetitively. You do it every day. You do it at length every day. I mean, you, you almost can't get enough of it. Now, obviously, accounting is not, not to that degree, but the same principle applies. If something's new to you, it's going to take repetition. So if you are willing to put in the work and you're willing to spend the time reviewing and, and doing the things that you need to do to succeed, it should come fairly easy. Okay? All right. So let's look at the schedule. All right. So you are green. Today we're going to start chapter seven. We're going to do the first two objectives. You guys will have a homework assignment that is due tomorrow. <clears throat> so the way that homework assignments will work, we'll have class on Thursday, and then your homework assignment will be due on Friday before midnight. <clears throat> okay? Now you can do it before then if you want to, but if you turn it in after midnight, it's going to have a late fee or a late penalty added into it. Okay? So once again, that goes back. If you do your homework on time, it's a free 300 points. If you choose not to, then obviously you won't be able to get 300 points. Okay? So the general structure is I plan to cover one to two objectives per period. All right? So we'll, I plan on finishing chapter seven next week. Then we'll start chapter eight. We'll spend two weeks on chapter eight. And then our first exam will be February the 11th. Okay? Our second exam will be March 18th. And then our third exam will be the week before Dead Week. Or actually, it's the week of Dead Week. Nope, just kidding. Yes, it is. Scratch that. April 22nd. So, um, so that's the way that our schedule will go. Um, the only difference, we'll have one homework assignment in Chapter 11. And as you look through the syllabus, you can see that. Uh, we'll have one homework assignment in Chapter 11 just because there's only a few objectives that I want to hit in there. <clears throat> and we'll have three homework assignments in Chapter 14 because of the amount of material in Chapter 14. Okay? Any questions so far? All right. The paper that you'll do this year. So last year, or last semester, the paper that you wrote was on the Sarbanes-Oxley Act and how it applied to businesses. The paper that you'll write this year is on the AICPA Code of Professional Conduct. So AICPA stands for the American Institute of Certified Public Accountants. And they have a code of conduct that all CPAs are required to abide by. Okay? And so what I want you to do is that students will be required to write a two to three page paper. That means at least a two page minimum. Uh, on an article using biblical scripture to prove how this code of conduct is complementary to the student's personal Christian views or beliefs. Students will then tell how compromising this code of conduct could impact their career in a real world environment. Okay? So that should be very easy to do. Minimum of three sources, just like first semester. Your textbook, the article that you use, and then the Bible. All right. All of our exams will be done on the iPad again through your lockdown browser. So if you don't have your iPad, if you want to do it on your computer, that's fine to do as well, but you know you have to go through a few extra steps uh, if you choose to do that. Okay. 
We're actually using the 28th edition. I need to update that textbook. Um, so let's see here. All right, course policies. I'm on page seven, page eight, sorry. So, you know, just like last semester, um, we're only in here an hour and 15 minutes a week. All right, so during that hour and 15 minutes, I don't want our cell phones to be a distraction. So if I, I would prefer that you lay your cell phone up here on the table as soon as you walk in and then pick it up on your way out. Uh, you don't have to do that today, but um, if I see you on your phone, then I have to ask you to leave. It's not really hard to, to see because, you know, if you're doing this number right here, there's not a lot that you could be doing other than being on your phone. So just help me out. You know, I'm trying to help you guys by going over the materials and I don't want you to be distracted with your phone. Now, if you have something going on, if you have some kind of important situation back home, by all means, tell me about it or tell me what's going on and you can keep it. But for the most part, just silence your phone, lay it up here on the table and pick it up at 1040 whenever we leave. Uh, all right, I need to read the honor code. Oh, one other thing. So when we take our test, um, you can use a calculator. You cannot use your phone as a calculator. So if you own a calculator, feel free to bring it when we take our test. And in saying that, <clears throat> you can work every problem that will work without a calculator. Obviously, it'll take a little bit longer, but um, we're not doing any long, drawn-out equations in here. But um, if you want to use a calculator, feel free to do that, but it cannot be your phone. Okay. All right, so the BMC honor code. <clears throat> we are all expected to follow the BMC honor code. Accepting my responsibility in a Christ-like manner for my own conduct and for the welfare of my fellow students at Blue Mountain College, I do hereby pledge myself to keep the rules of BMC, to report my own violations, and to use my influence to induce other students to keep the rules of the college and to report their own violations. The principle of honor. I will at all times develop and uphold high standards of honesty in thought, speech, and behavior. Principle of self-control. I will at all times control my personal desires in harmony with the social good of all, considering the interest of others to be of equal value with my own. The principle of conformity. I will at all times work in accordance with the expectations consistent with biblical values and the traditions of Blue Mountain College. And then the principle of good citizenship. I will at all times cooperate with the rules and policies of the college. All right. Now, that, that code encompasses everything. Um, namely, so one thing I forgot to call out. When we do our paper, okay? Scroll back up to it. So when you do your paper, you're going to turn it in through Canvas. And Canvas has this turn it in software. All right, so any paper that's been turned in to Blue Mountain College is stored in that Turnitin software. So if you take a paper from a friend who took my course two years ago and you put your name on it and act like it's yours, then Turnitin is going to notify, notify me of that and we'll have to have a conversation. So everybody do your own work. Don't copy other people's and we shouldn't have any issues, okay? All right, last thing I want to mention is attendance. All right, so we meet twice a week. On your fourth absence, you're cut out from the class. And that's not me, that's a school thing. So um, baseball or sports or cross country, those type things, those are excused absences. But on your fourth, I guess, unexcused absence, you're cut out from the course. So like Kevin's already a fourth of the way there and it's the second day of class. So, just kidding. But, um, so make sure that you come to class. <clears throat> and I know the attendance assignments are not the most fun thing in the world, but make sure you get those turned into. Okay, any questions? Going once, 
Going twice. All right, let's open up our textbook. So if you go to modules, and then the fourth module down is our textbook. So then it loads in a new window. All right, so like I said, we're going to start with chapter 7. And chapter 7 is on inventory. So when I, when I say the word inventory, what's the, what do you guys think of? Say what? What you got on hand. Stock? Yeah. yeah, so what they have on hand. All right, so yeah, inventory. So think about Best Buy, okay? What all, does, what all does Best Buy have as inventory in their store? A lot of stuff, right? Computers, phones. Uh, and I think now they sell refrigerators and washers and dryers and all that stuff. So everything that sits on their floor, on their showroom floor, is considered inventory. All right, so when you think about a store like Best Buy or a company like Best Buy, and you think about their balance sheet, all right? You guys remember what goes on a balance sheet? So a balance sheet is assets, liabilities, and owner's equity. And the accounting equation is assets equals liabilities plus owner's equity. So, when you think about the assets that Best Buy owns, so they obviously would have cash, probably have some accounts receivable, then they would have inventory. I would venture a guess that, and then they also have buildings, all their property, plant and equipment, stuff like that. But I would venture a guess that inventory is probably the biggest number on their balance sheet. Because, I mean, how does Best Buy survive? You go into their store, you go online, and you buy their products. So they have to have ample inventory to be able to handle the demand of customers. Okay? So that's what this chapter is on. We're going to talk about how we report inventory, how we protect inventory, and the different ways that inventory might flow through different businesses. Okay? So thinking about Best Buy. All right, if inventory is the number one biggest item on their balance sheet, what do you think their concerns might be over inventory? So what would be a concern they would have about inventory? If it's their biggest number. They need to sell it, yeah. Uh, you think they're worried about employees stealing? Yes. Possibly. Uh, so with inventory, the two biggest drivers or the two most important factors would be making sure that the inventory you have is safe, is safeguarded against theft or not just theft, but say you can ruin. So, you know, if they had it in a back warehouse where the temperature got up to I don't know, 120 degrees. I mean, that could damage computers, it could damage phones. So keeping things in a safe storage capacity and also keeping it away from theft. And then also, so if it's the biggest number on their balance sheet, well, they want to make sure that that number is correct. Okay, because the number one goal in accounting for a business from a financial perspective to make sure that your financial statements are correct, all right? So we don't want, if they had a million dollars worth of inventory, we don't want them showing that they had $1,000. We also don't want them showing that they had $10 million. So we want them to show an accurate number for inventory. So that means <clears throat> accurate reporting in the financial statements and then also safeguarding their assets, okay? So how do they do that? 
All right? When you go into Best Buy and you buy, let's say that you're buying an iPhone, how does that process work? Do they have iPhones kind of sitting out in the middle? You just go up to the rack, grab one, and walk up to the, to the uh, cashier? What are they, where do they have their Apple products? Normally they're locked behind the, uh, the checkout area in a cage, right? Have you guys been in a Best Buy lately? I actually haven't. But the last time I went in there, so that would have been a few years ago, they had all their iPads and iPhones. Like, you know, you walk in and then over to the right, there's this huge bay with a cage door lock on it. And that's where they have all their, um, all their Apple products. Same thing for a computer. If you went in there and bought a computer, what you do is you grab a card and then you take that card to an associate and they go to the back and get the computer that you want to buy. Okay, so that's twofold. <clears throat> Number one, they're making sure that you can't steal because um, I feel like theft might be high if those things are just sitting out in the open. But um, so you go, you go to the desk, say, hey, I'd like to buy an iPhone 12. So they turn around, they unlock it from the cage, they give you the phone, they scan the barcode on it, take your payment, and then they give you a receipt. All right? Now that receipt is a means of safeguarding inventory. Okay? You can take that receipt, and it shows that you actually purchased those goods, but also Best Buy has a, a record of that receipt. So you couldn't come in three days later and say, hey, I paid for this iPhone, but I never got one. That, that won't happen, right? Because their inventory was correctly marked when you purchased it. Now, that's on a personal scale. Think about on a large scale for companies. All right? So think about, continue with Best Buy. Think about when Best Buy purchases their products from Apple. Okay? I have no clue how many phones they buy. I would assume it's in the hundreds of thousands, though if you think about how many Best Buy stores there are. <clears throat> so Best Buy, however it goes, calls up Apple and says, hey, we'd like to buy 100,000 iPhone 12s, okay? At that moment, a purchase order is created, okay? That purchase order will show the item that they're buying, will show the quantity of the item that they're buying, and it'll show the agreed upon price. So do you think Best Buy is paying $9.99 for a phone? Probably not, right? They probably play, pay a reduced price, and they mark it up for us to buy, like everything else. So the purchase order is going to show the item description, quantity, and price. All right? So purchase order authorizes the purchase of the inventory from Apple, the approved vendor. Next... Apple takes that purchase order and they say, hey, we've got to send however many phones to Best Buy. So they package them all up, put them on crates, put them in boxes, and they ship them to Best Buy. Now, when Best Buy receives this order, what are they going to do? So if you're working at Best Buy and a shipment came in from Apple, do you think they take it off the crate or they take it off the pallet they never unwrap it. They never check it. They just take Apple's word for it and immediately go and put it on the shelf. Yeah, they're going to check. They're going to check to make sure, hey, we bought 100,000. Did we actually get 100,000? We bought iPhone 12s. Did we get iPhone 12s or did we get iPhone 11 SEs? Um, and so that receiving report is going to show what you're actually receiving. So it would show we bought 100,000 iPhone 12s at this price, and you're going to take the receiving report and match it up to the purchase order. All right? So you're going to make sure those things agree. All right? Then lastly, Apple's going to send you an invoice. And that invoice is going to say, hey, you owe us X amount of dollars because you bought 100,000 iPhone 12s at this price, okay? So the purchase order, 
receiving report, vendor's invoice. They all three show the same thing, and that's called the three-way match. So you want to match those up and make sure, is the description the same on all three? Is the amount that we ordered the same on all three? Is the price that we agreed to pay the same on all three? And if it's not, then you would investigate any differences. Um, but it's very important. Now, with Apple and Best Buy, I wouldn't think that there would be any, any shady business. But say that you have an employee that's trying to steal. And they figured out a way to be able to order extras and ship them to a fictitious address. Okay? Which happens a lot more often than you would think. So, on the purchase order, it might show we ordered 150,000 phones. But, on the receiving report, we only received 100,000. So we'd say, hey, we bought 150,000, but we only received 100,000. What happened to the other 50,000 phones? So you would go and investigate and potentially could uncover fraud. It's the way some fraud has been uncovered. All right, so it's very important especially with inventory being uh, as large of a number as it is, that those things and those procedures are followed. Any questions? All right. So like in chapter two, if you remember, um, the book, so what we're gonna do is we're gonna record the purchase of inventory and we're gonna record the flow of inventory through our business. Now, in chapter two, <clears throat> when we were recording journal entries, the book spent a lot of time detailing a separate, say, an accounts receivable ledger or a separate cash ledger in addition to the general ledger, which is where all of our main journal entries go. We didn't really spend a lot of time talking about that. Same thing in uh, chapter seven. So they talk about recording inventory in a subsidiary inventory ledger. We're not going to spend any time on that. So this part right here, I don't have a, I don't have a red highlight, but the blue stuff, we're not, we're not going to spend time on that. Okay, so when you're going back reading through, you won't have any problems on it. So make sure that you skip over that. All right. So this says, finally, controls for safeguarding inventory should include security measures to prevent damage and customer or employee theft. Some examples of security measures include the following. Storage inventory in areas that are restricted to only authorized employees. Locking high-priced inventory in cabinets. And then using two-way mirrors, cameras, security tags, or guards. All right, so we talked about Best Buy using um, using the, the locked cages. I'll give you guys an example. So when I was in school, when I was in college, I worked at a brake shoe factory in Memphis. And um, very hot, about like it is in here right now. Um, it would get to be about 100 degrees in the plant. And uh, there's only one way in and one way out. And the reason for that was a security measure because I don't know if you guys know about brake shoes, but they're pretty big and they can be expensive. And so there was a risk that employees might try to steal some brake shoes, okay, to sell to friends or to sell on the street. <clears throat> so by limiting entry and exit to one door, they were able to monitor how you walked out of the plant every day. So, you know, if it got to be 4.30, you clock out, and you're just walking out by yourself, well, you're, you're not taking anything. But if you're, you've got a coat on, and the coat's stuck out to here, and you know, you're trying to carry some stuff and trying to hide it, I mean, they can easily see that, hey, you might not, you might be trying to take some things. So, it's just an added security step that they implemented to try and prevent theft. All right. So let's look at reporting inventory. All right, so 7-1-B. 
Does anybody remember the two types of inventory systems that a company can use? Say it again. They both start with P's. One's periodic. Another one starts with per and ends with perpetual. Perpetual. <clears throat> so yeah, there's two different ways that a company can account for their inventory. All right, perpetual inventory system is what 95% of the world uses now because computers are so prevalent. Um, but the perpetual inventory system says every time you make a sale and every time you make a purchase, your inventory records are updated. The periodic inventory system If we're looking at a T account, so the periodic inventory system says we know what our beginning balance of inventory is. We also know any inventory that we purchased because anytime we use cash or accounts payable, we have to make an entry. So we're going to always calculate purchases and we're going to perform a physical inventory count at the end of the month. So we're gonna know what our ending balance is. So we back into the amount of inventory that we sold. We know beginning balance, we know how many purchases we made, and then we do a physical inventory count at the end of the month to know what our ending balance is. So we can back into how much inventory we actually sell that way. All right, a physical inventory count. It's always taken at year end. You close down your plant, you print out an inventory report that says, hey, we should have all of these items in our warehouse at this time. Then you take that report and you go line by line and make sure if we say we have a thousand computers of this specific type, then we actually have a thousand computers. Okay? And then you investigate any discrepancies. All right? And then from there, so that gives you your ending inventory count to put on your financial statements. So how does inventory flow through a business? So, you know, we know that we have a beginning balance, we record purchases, and we come up with our ending balance. But how does the inventory that we sell how does that flow out of our business and how do we record that for our books? Very important question, depending on which industry you work in, you could potentially choose a different cost flow assumption. All right, so think about this. An accounting issue arises when identical units of merchandise are acquired at different unit cost during a period. Okay, so let's pick something simple. Let's say that let's say that we're buying hmm, let's say that we're buying lumber. Okay, so on March on May tenth, we buy one two by four. The cost of that two by four was nine dollars. Okay. And then on May 18th, we buy an additional 2x4. But now the price has gone up. So the price of that 2x4 was $13. Then on the 24th, let's say we buy one more. Okay? Price went up again. So the price of that 2x4 is $14. Alright? So overall, we bought three two by fours in the month of May, and they cost 36 bucks collectively. All right, now, if I asked you, or if I gave you this scenario, let's say that we sold one on May 20th, on May 28th, sorry. So on May 28th, we sold one piece of lumber, and we sold it for $20. All right, how much money did we make on that sale of lumber? So depending on which inventory cost flow assumption we use, we can get three different answers. All 
Like I said, there's three different ways that inventory can be uh, recorded. And they are FIFO, LIFO, and weighted average cost. Okay? Has anyone heard those before? Did we talk about that in the first semester? I don't remember. So first in, first out is what FIFO stands for. Last in, first out is what LIFO stands for. And weighted average cost is what um, WAP stands for. All right, so let's walk it through. So let's say that we sold this one on 510, okay? Our sales price was $20. Our cost of goods sold would be $9. So our gross profit on that sale would be $11. And then if we sold that one, we would have two left over at the end of the month. So our ending inventory would be 27 bucks. All right? Now let's say instead that we sold the middle. Our sales price would still be 20 bucks. But now our cost of goods sold is $13. So our gross profit is only seven bucks. And our ending inventory now is $23. Okay, then lastly, if we sold this one, the last one that we bought, sales price is still 20. Now our cost of goods sold is 14. So that gives us a gross profit of only $6, but our ending inventory is $22. So which one is right? Anybody have a guess? Can they all three be right? Yeah. yeah, depending on which method we choose, all three of those could be right. So the question is, how do we determine which method we use? All right? I'm glad you guys asked that. So, it can differ between industries, and also it differs based on, on what you're actually selling, all right? So let's start with um, first in, first out. All right, so what does first in, first out mean? First in, first out means <coughs> the cost flow is in the order of which, the order in which they were incurred, okay? So first in, first out says, you sell your oldest inventory every time. And it says at the end of the month, what you'll be left with is your most recent purchases. Okay? So let's think about an industry where first in, first out makes sense. Okay? So I used an example of milk at the beginning of the class. How do you think Walmart accounts for milk? If you're putting milk out on the shelf. Uh, first in, first out. Yeah. So you don't want... If you have milk with expiration dates of 510, 518, and 524, which one are you going to put in the front? 510, right? Because if it goes past 510, that milk is expired. So with first in, first out, we want to sell all of our oldest inventory first and keep our, our most recent purchases on hand at the end of the month. Same thing with produce. So if you're selling oranges, you don't want to put your very newest oranges up front because by the time people get to the back, they might be old. They might be or molded. So you want to put your oldest inventory first so that when they come up and grab an orange, they're grabbing the oldest and you've got time for your most recent purchases to mature. Does that make sense? All right, so that's first in, first out. So whatever you bought first, you sell first. Whatever you bought last, you sell last. All right, now compare that to the second assumption, which is last in, first out. Okay? So in the last in, first out, it's going to be the opposite of first in, first out. 
So in last in, first out, the cost flow is the reverse of the order in which they were bought. All right? So in last in, first out, we're going to sell our most recent goods first. And at the end of the month, what we should be left with is our oldest inventory, our oldest purchases. Now what type of industry, can you think of an industry where that might be beneficial? Do what? Why fast food? Because uh, they usually get the precious food out first and anything that's gotten cold and Well, possibly. I might argue that they use first name first out so that they're not wasting materials. One of the, one of the industries that I thought of was a lumber company. All right. So <clears throat> if you look back at 2020, so you know in March everything shut down. The price of lumber from... From February to April, <clears throat> quadruple, because everybody was staying at home, you know, projects that you might have put off for years or months, you now have time to do them. And so there's just this lack of lumber to be purchased. So when the, when the demand goes up and the supply goes down, the price shoots up. So if you were building a house in March, April, May, and that was a good time to be on the house because you're just buying the lumber. Who ends up paying for the, the end cost? The buyer, right? Whoever buys the house, they're going to have to pay you whatever the supplies cost. So if you're a, if you're a lumber yard and you have, let's say your March lumber, let's say it costs $10 a piece, and you have your April lumber and it cost forty dollars a piece and a customer comes in and they say hey I want to buy a thousand feet of two by fours well which bucket are you going to pull from to sell them you going to sell them the cheaper stuff or the more expensive stuff the more expensive stuff right because they have to buy it anyway they have to pay for the lumber that you're selling so in an industry and in a time where prices are continually rising, LIFO is the inventory cost flow assumption that is used. And the reason is the end price gets pushed to the consumer. So if you can charge more, that's what companies want to do. Okay? So does that make sense? So last in, first out is... You're pulling from your most recent purchases first, and what you're gonna be left with at the end of the year is your oldest purchases, and theoretically, your cheapest inventory, okay? All right, now the third is weighted average cost. And weighted average cost is simply just an average. So, just like we did here, we took an average of how many pieces we bought, three pieces, Took an average of the total cost it took to get them, 36. So you take total cost divided by total units. So the weighted average cost of those three would be $12. All right. Now what type of industry might use weighted average cost? Generally, it's industries where you cannot the right way to work this. It's industries where you can't go and look at your inventory and decide when things were purchased. All right, so think about, so when I worked at KPMG as an auditor, I would do uh, inventory counts. I've mentioned the ones that I did at Dirt Cheap. I would also do inventory counts at oil refineries. Okay, so in El Dorado, Arkansas, there's an oil company called Lion Oil. And on December 31st, We'd be in El Dorado, and at midnight, they'd shut their plant down, and we would climb up on those huge... So we'd climb up on those huge oil refineries, you know, the big bats. We'd climb up to the top, and they have a little chute that opens up, and we had this little contraption. There was a a metal stick on a string. 
And so you lower the string down into the back until you feel it hit oil. And then you mark on that string, it's got a uh, length of measurement on there. And so that tells you how full that bat is, okay? And then you compare that to the last time they did that at the end of November. All right, now when you talk about oil, when Lionel purchased oil from wherever they bought it from, all they would do is dump it in that bat. So in, in January, they dumped it in there. February, they dumped it in there. March, they dumped it in there. So then whenever Exxon or Shell or BP, one of these gas stations, whenever they want to buy oil, they can't determine what was January's oil versus February or March. You know, the price of oil is constantly changing. So what they do is they take an average and they say, we bought this many units of oil at this price. So in this vat, we've got X number of units and this is the total price. And so they just average it out. The same way with, you know, the BMB gravel company or BMB concrete, whatever it is here on 15. You drive by and they just have these huge mounds of uh, gravel. They, they can't pinpoint what day that was produced. So they take an average of all the gravel that would be made up in there and that's how they determine the cost that they provide to the customer. Does that make sense? So those are the three units. Sorry, three cost flow assumptions. First in, first out, last in, first out, and weighted average cost. Okay? Which one do you think Best Buy uses? It says first in, first out. Why would Best Buy use first in, first out instead of last in, first out? So let's say that, um, so we're talking about iPhones again. Let's say that it's August and Best Buy still has 100,000 iPhone 11s, okay? They know that in September, the iPhone 12 is gonna come out and they're gonna be buying a bunch of iPhone 12s. I'll say they buy a million iPhone 12s. What happens to the iPhone 11 in the consumer's eye whenever the iPhone 12 comes out? It's less than, right? You know, the iPhone 12 has all these different things that make it better, even though it's probably just marginally better. Uh, to the consumer's eye, they would rather buy the iPhone 12. So if Best Buy doesn't push the iPhone 11, this is a simplified example, but if they don't push the sale of the iPhone 11, then they could potentially be left with a lot of not necessarily dead inventory, but less attractive inventory. So they want to sell their oldest goods first, just like the refrigerators or computers or any type of technology. You always want to get your oldest inventory out the door before it becomes obsolete. You guys see where I'm coming from? All right. So let's look at an example. All right, so if you guys will scroll down to exercise exhibit, example exercise 7-1. And this will be what we'll finish with today. So it says the following three identical units are purchased during February. Purchase one on February 8th at a cost of 45 bucks, one on February 15th at a cost of 48 bucks, and one on February 26th at a cost of 51 bucks. All right, so it says assume that one unit is sold on February 27th for $70. And then here's the question to us. Determine gross profit for February and ending inventory as of the end of the month using first in first out last in first out and weighted average cost okay so you guys take a second think about how you would start working that and then we'll work it together 
And that's what your homework, these type questions, is what your homework is going to be. All right, let's look at FIFO first. Okay. So, we had three purchases during the month. One for 45, one for 48, and one for 51. Okay. So on the 27th, we had a sale at $70. One unit at $70. All right. Now, if we're using first in, first out, which item did we sell? The one on February 8th, the one on February 15th, or the one on the 26th? On February 8th, our oldest inventory, the one that we bought first, is the one that we sell first. Okay? So, cost of goods sold for that one is going to be 45 bucks. So our gross profit for this one item for the month of February is $25. Okay? So that's part of the answer. Then they asked us to figure out what is ending inventory at the end of February. So we no longer have the purchase that we made on February 8th. But we do still have the one we made on the 15th and the 26th. So when we add those two together, we have two units. And collectively, they're $99. So that would be our ending inventory for the end of the month. Everybody understand that? Pretty easy, right? Okay, let's think about LIFO. So last in, first out. And the trouble for you guys, I think, when we take our test, is making sure that you know which method is being asked on which problem, okay? So if you're reading the question and you just read over it real quick, you might say FIFO, you think it would be LIFO, you work the problem, and you get the wrong answer. So just being on top of and making sure that you understand what's actually being asked. All right, so LIFO, still sold one at 70 bucks, but now we're using our last in first out. So this most recent purchase that we made on the 26th, that's the one that we're actually going to sell. And it cost us $51. So our cost of goods sold is $51. So in this example, our gross profit is only $19. All right, then if we sold our most recent purchase, that means we still have these two at the end of the month. So ending inventory would be $93. Two units at $93. Okay? Simple enough too, right? All right, so finally, the last. This is the one where you potentially have the most work to do. So the way that the bucket has it right now, you most likely won't see this on the test. All right. On the test, you would be given the dates, the purchases, and the cost per purchase. The book has gone ahead and given you the total amount of cost as well as the average cost per unit. So these two things right here, you would have to solve on your own if we were working a, a test problem. Okay, so what we would do is you would say, hey, how many units did I buy this month? Bought one at 45, one at 48, and one at 51. So in all, I bought three units. In all, they cost me $144. So the average of that, 144 divided by three, is $48 per unit. And then this becomes our unit of measurement for all of our questions, okay? So we made a sale at 70 bucks. Our cost of goods sold is gonna be that average of $48. So 
Our gross profit is 22 bucks. Then we know for ending inventory, we have two left over, two units. So you say 48 times two, and our ending inventory is 96 bucks. Does that make sense? Yes, no, maybe? Yeah. Okay. All right. So that's all I've got for today before I let you go. So if you go to modules and you go to week one, Tyler, you'll do group A. But the rest of you guys, you'll click on chapter seven, homework, group B. It'll load in a new window. Work the problems. Like I said, you can work them more than once. Um, they're due tomorrow night before midnight. So if you turn it in Saturday morning, it'll come with a late penalty attached. For next week, um, go ahead and read objectives three through five. You know, it didn't take us long at all to read the objectives. So go ahead and read objectives three through five because that's what we're gonna discuss in class.